Good evening from Kohan Colette's. It's another lazily shot but deeply thought video. Oof. Awkward rhyme. I guess it's time that I read a poem on this channel. I'll provide a little context first so I don't jump into the poetry the same way. Uh, Finnish people jump into the pool after the hot sauna. You know, the ice water. I don't know if they call this the artistup. And we're talking about, I don't know, sort of put it in context. Well, I'm getting up there in age. I'm almost 30. You know, that's not old, but that used to mean something, being 30. You'd have a house. You'd have your wife and your kids. And you'd have your car. Your little nuclear family in the suburbs. And, of course, you had your desk job or your factory job or any kind of job that puts that food on the table for your housewife and your kids and put your kids through school of course that was bullshit then <laughs> and it's especially bullshit now a lot of people my age have this confirmation bias thing that they should expect the same life that their parents had of course, that's ignoring the fact that throughout evolutionary history, even being a parent is not necessarily the most common thing. Everyone has a parent, but it's rare enough to be a parent. I guess that's why children's media is, is so common, because anyone can relate to a child's perspective. But the older you get, the more obscure the perspective seems. And what we're talking today about childhood and colonialism and the Western attitude to childhood and how it informs colonialism and how we colonize our children, essentially. That's, that's my gimmick for today's video, or tonight's video, since it's rather late. So I'm choosing not to use my full theatrical projection. I thought it'd be good to begin with a very offensive poem by Rudyard Kipling. Take up the white man's burden. <laughs> good start. <laughs> Send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile. To serve your captors' need. To wait in heavy harness. On fluttered folk and wild. Your new caught sullen people half devil and half child so this poem i believe was written in 19 i mean 18 excuse me, 18 98 18 99 around the american acquisition and colonization of the philippines and to those of you who don't know the united states after the Spanish-American War occupied several pieces of formerly Spanish territory and carried on the process of brutal colonialism <laughs> that the Spanish left behind. And the significant case of that being the Philippine War, which lasted over a decade and involved some of the most heinous crimes ever committed in human history, not just in American history such as interring Philippine people in concentration camps, extermination of entire villages. And since this was over 100 years ago, we'll just pretend it didn't happen. Because who cares? It's not important. Let's talk more about Martin Luther King Jr. Because the winds of change are always positive. The, the, the future will always bring positive change. But of course, we, we all know that's bullshit. <laughs> Change comes through immense effort and immense sacrifice. And in some cases, that sacrifice is not just a sacrifice you pay. It's a sacrifice your family pays or innocent people pay. Or your morality. Sometimes you sacrifice your own conscience in the service of a better future talking about colonialism 
they almost kind of feel, you know, the, the as I did growing up in the early 2000s, the age of George Bush and his war in Iraq, which I could already, as at a young age, realize was absolute horseshit. But the adults didn't seem to really understand that so much. Of course, there were some who who realized that the war was horseshit <laughs> and that Bush was horseshit. But the, the greater portion is like, well, we can agree to disagree. Of course, we don't really want you to disagree with us. You just have to go along with what we say because we have the power. Fuck you, essentially. <laughs> but don't use those words. Those words are for Bowdoin. <laughs> Children are essentially colonized in Western culture. What it means, maturity in Western culture, means accepting the status quo, accepting the values of the society you're brought up in without question, without resistance. And if you do have any qualms, you raise them in a civil manner. You know, just just complain. <laughs> of course, people will complain that you're complaining. And they'll complain that you're complaining louder than you're complaining. And you may even be the subject of state terror for your complaining. <laughs> but this is the civil manner. How you should engage with, you know, change. And at the very worst, you know, maybe you can go out in the street and get brutalized by the police for the... You know, for the TV cameras. That's about the most spicy sort of resistance to injustice that liberalism will tolerate. And I can, you know, of course, any form of dissent is tolerable as long as it's marketable on a t-shirt. Hence the Che Guevara t-shirts, the, uh, the iconic Che Guevara t-shirts. I feel like... That's an overplayed trope, personally, and Che Guevara deserves more respect than that for the immense sacrifice he made for the struggle of oppressed peoples and workers. That's just my opinion, though. We have to have our own heroes, and Che Guevara is deserving to be regarded as a hero, even if he had a few flaws. I mean, we, don't we all? Look at the liberal heroes. You know, the fucking Churchill is a hero. Bro starves, you know, millions of Bengalis to death. And essentially justified it as, well, you know, they're not as important as British people for the war effort. <laughs> I think the smartest thing the British ever did was getting rid of him the second the war was over. <laughs> What they should have done was clapped him in irons, or better yet, hanged him, introduced him to Madame à la guillotine, along with their monarchy. The British are a very degenerate people in that they hold on to the most insipid customs of the past and pretend that it's the most prestigious thing in the world. You know... <laughs> And then they go around and pretend that they're so much more civilized than everyone else when they're kissing rocks and worshipping sticks or whatever. <laughs> the fucking Britishers. So when we're talking about colonialism, we always frame colonized people as children and then they frame anyone who wants to improve society as a child. And of course, colonized people get the colonized mindset, this maturity that you must fit into society, you must conform to it, and in doing that, you only by doing that can you expect to have a comfortable, acceptable life, meeting your basic needs and being able to support a family. Of course, the reality does not live up to that because capitalism cannot. Capitalism requires infinite growth. And for that infinite growth, it cannot exist within 
its own little petri dish, it has to engage in imperialist activities. It has to exploit workers and eliminate the competition of foreign powers. The danger, ultimately, of socialism in the third world was not that it would spread socialism in Asia, and that was the evil in and of itself. They were not really concerned with that. They were concerned about the industrialization of Asia, the industrialization of Latin America and Africa, so that they would no longer be merely plantation estates for the West. Now, of course, the West has moved past the idea of actually having industry in their own countries, so they've replaced the plantation system in Asia and Africa with the factory system in Asia and Africa. But the effect is the same, the exploitation of the labor and resources of this region for the benefit of a minuscule elite and absolutely no one else. <laughs> but to admit that well, college student sort of attitude, grow up, <laughs> get a job, sir. The bums will always lose, Lebowski. It's, it's subversive to kind of like say, well, maybe we don't want that sort of job where you're sitting at a cubicle for the best 50 years of your life to hopefully have enough money to retire and then sit in front of a TV and scream about how lazy kids are these days. That's not the life that people in my generation want because we have, you know, a couple of brain cells beating around there that weren't beaten out of us during the Cold War. We're kind of brought up after the Cold War and after the fact that you know, <laughs> we, we, we're we no longer illusioned in the same sense by communism. In our generation, we've seen communism succeed. <laughs> the Chinese communist experiment has been an unmitigated success in our generation and a tremendous threat to capitalism at outperforming it in its own game. And they try to rationalize it and justify it by saying, well, by adopting capitalism, <laughs> by adopting the free market, they outperform the U.S., but they're not actually ad adopting capitalism. The way the Chinese economy works is its state-controlled and planned economies. Every business in China of a certain size has a government commissar that has control over the decisions that the company makes, that they coerce them out of making decisions that are bad for China, that are strategically bad for the people and the government of China and their national interests, which we don't have in the United States. We let the companies essentially police themselves. And in this cutthroat sort of competition between, you know, companies and any semblance of order or sanity, we end up with, you know, essentially criminal syndicates masquerading as businesses <laughs> and that's how things work in the u.s whereas in china at least the government's in control <laughs> they keep things under control that things are not essentially governed by what are essentially criminal syndicates <laughs> now of course there is a lot of the excesses of capitalism within the chinese system there's no doubt about that but that it's planned and organized and with a goal, you know. The only goal that the government in America seems to have is accept bribes and perform in the interest of those who bribe you. That's the only interest of the American government, which is why the American president can never be the most powerful man in the world. He can only represent the interests of the bourgeois and they have a diverse set of interests in themselves, contradictory interests. On one hand, you know, the oil industry is dependent on no action being taken against climate change. But a lot of other industries are completely dependent on 
actually maybe not having this disasters caused by climate change. This is the fact of like the confused liberal mess that the United States is, is it's ultimately its, its biggest weakness. It cannot focus on what's in its interest. It can only focus on what's in the interest of those who pay its corrupt leaders, which is why China will ultimately prevail because at least even if they're starting from the worst possible position they have a goal and they have the orientation and will and organizational skills to work towards a goal they will obviously face struggles and pitfalls but not to the same extent that i'm sure <laughs> is going to occur to the world as a result of the corruption and ignorance of the United States and Western capital. The United States, the UK being big centers of it, but also France and Germany and all those, you know, beautiful countries that still have all their cultural heritage that wasn't destroyed by colonism, colonialism, because they didn't destroy it themselves. <laughs> I'm talking about like visiting cultural sites. You can read about the beautiful cultural sites of Africa and Asia in many cases in a history book because the colonists destroyed them themselves and then erased the idea that they ever existed. Create the idea that Africans are mud farmers living in mud houses starving to death, needing clean water, needing you to donate money <laughs> to dig a well. And they'll say, oh yeah, round up your, your, your grocery bill. Donate to build and digging wells in Africa, sort of thing. Of course, they've already made their donation and they're essentially asking you for free money. <laughs> America is just such an absurdly horrendous place. There's really... No positive thing to say about it other than it's so absurd and it's over-the-top ridiculous evilness that it becomes kind of funny just to talk about it from the basis of how it actually is. You can't really satirize it because it's already, you know, the most extreme version of itself. You might as well be making jokes about the Nazis at that point. You can't, like, exaggerate Nazis. You can't exaggerate Americans. They're both the most extreme version of themselves. <laughs> well, that ended up being a bitter tangent. Just, just know, you know, just because you don't find work doesn't mean you're a bad person because you're not productive 24 hours a day <laughs> I mean you're a bad person just because you don't know everything in the world I mean you're a bad person I can learn more it's actually quite a bit easier as a result of this technology to expose yourself to new ideas think about things you know let them run your head before you sleep you know process it a bit think about those things you'd be embarrassed to talk about those sort of philosophical ideas that you feel like you're not capable of understanding because you are capable of understanding them even as a child as, a, as an adult especially but as an adult you have to like who, when else are you going to do it plopped out dead without having a single original thought in your head or even like a completely unoriginal thought just just think something be unashamed about it try to change society